Good morning and welcome to the webinar Mandatory Disclosure Rules on Cross-Border Tax Arrangements. Are you ready? My name is Deirdre Overhill, International Tax Manager at Grant Thornton, and with me today are Monique Pisters, IBC Director and Partner International Tax at Grant Thornton, and Hank Monen, Founder of Tax Model and Developer of the DUC6 Pro uh, Tool Solution. Uh, later on, uh, Menno van Werkhoven will also join us at the table uh, and will discuss um, the approach of Grant Thornton. He is head of tax technology with Grant Thornton. Uh, today's agenda is as follows. Uh, we will start with a number of questions to Monique uh, regarding the content and obligations arising from the EU MDR directive. Subsequently, I will ask a number of questions to Menno and Hank regarding the Grant Thornton's approach and um, the DOC6 uh, regulations and the DOC6 Pro a risk management tool, which we can offer in collaboration with Tax Model. Via the Q&A function, um, you can ask questions, which we will try to answer as much as possible during the webinar, first to Monique, and at the end of the webinar to Hank and Menno. Uh, and if questions cannot be addressed during this webinar, please note that we will bundle all questions and will send them via e email in the next few days, including a high-level answer. Technical issues could be raised uh, via the chat function. Um, well, Monique, let's start with you. Um, could you please tell us something about the purpose and the background of the MDR DOC6 regulations? Yes, of course. Um, well, first of all, I would like to emphasize that I will be focusing on the Dutch implementation of uh, the Mandatory Disclosure Directive. So there are differences across Europe uh, with regards to the requirements or the fines involved. And if there are any questions on that, um, of course, uh, feel free to ask them. But for now, I will be focusing on the Dutch implementation. Um, now, back to your question. Uh, you asked me regarding the purpose and the background of DEC6. Well, DEC 6 actually arose from BEPS, BEPS action point number 12, and BEPS stands for the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project of the OECD. So um, this action point actually recommended jurisdictions uh, to um, uh, come up with a, a mandatory reporting for certain um, uh, cross-border arrangements which might be uh, considered uh, as aggressive. Um, so, as such, the purpose of DAC 6 is to enhance transparency across the EU member states, but also to discourage intermediaries from advising, uh, marketing and designing uh, yeah, cross-border arrangements which are considered uh, tax aggressive. So, taking that into account, on May 25, 2018, uh, the Council of the European Union officially adopted the Mandatory Disclosure Directive. And with this adaption, uh, intermediaries, but also in some circumstances, uh, taxpayers should have to report certain uh, cross-border arrangements with the, the local uh, tax authorities. Uh, for the Netherlands, this directive considers almost all taxes, with only a few exceptions, such as value-added tax, custom duties, and social security contributions. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned that taxpayers or intermediaries must report certain cross-border arrangements. Could you elabor elaborate a little bit further on who has to report exactly? Yeah, of course. Um, so the primary uh, obligation to report lies with intermediaries. And intermediaries are described as those persons who are involved in designing, marketing, uh, or managing the implementation of a certain cross-border arrangement. But also people who are assisting with the implementation or providing advice can be considered as intermediaries. Um, but not always does an intermediary have to report, because if there's another intermediary who already did the report, then it's sufficient for the other intermediary to have the reference number in his files to report. Now, I guess an important thing to note is that it's not always intermediaries who have to report. Sometimes this reporting obligation shifts to the multinational or the taxpayer. I have here a slide in which I uh, can, uh, can show you. So there are a number of circumstances uh, in which the multinational or the taxpayer will have to file himself. Think, for instance, of uh, an in-house tax department, which can be considered, can considered an intermediary. If you are a big tax department at a large multinational, you can design and implement cross-border arrangements yourself. 
So under circumstances, you will be regarded as an intermediary. Another example is one where no intermediary at all is involved. So let's say you do a cross-border transaction without any assistance, then you might be the one to have to report as well. A third example is um, when a prof professional privilege applies in a jurisdiction. Think, for instance, of lawyers. In such a situation, this intermediary must report on a no-name basis and subsequently provide that reference number to the taxpayer or the multinational, and subsequently the multinational will have to file the report. And last but not least, as this is an EU directive, if uh, a taxpayer uh, has an intermediary, which is not a resident in uh, the uh, EU, then the reporting obligation also shifts to the uh, taxpayer or the multinational himself. Thanks. That's quite an important um, uh, factor in this um, MDR regulation. Um, so you mentioned that not all cross-border cross -border arrangements has to be reported. Can you tell us which transactions must be reported? Yeah, of course. So actually, two requirements need to be met in order to have a reportable cross-border tra transaction slash arrangement. So first, there needs to be a cross-border element, uh, which affects at least one EU member state. And second, uh, the uh, cross-border arrangement must fall on the one of the so-called hallmarks. Let's go to a slide to uh, explain you some more about these, uh, these hallmarks. Mm -hmm. So the directive actually mentions five categories of hallmarks. Um, so features which fall under the scope of the disclosure obligation. The hallmarks relate to features in cross-border arrangements um, that indicate that there is a potential risk of tax avoidance in them. And as you can see, um, there are some hallmarks which have a main benefit test attached to them and some which don't. And the main benefit test means that if the main benefit of the arrangement is to create a tax advantage, then uh, uh, the hallmark has to, or the arrangement has to be disclosed. Um, now, I don't want to make it too technical, but I do want to give a brief overview of the five hallmarks to give you a bit of an idea of what these hallmarks are and what you should think of. So category A, again, with this main benefit test are generic hallmarks, um, uh, which, uh, for instance, have uh, agreements with intermediaries. So let's say uh, an example given under A is uh, where an intermediary has an agreement with a taxpayer that the fee the taxpayer is paying him depends on the tax advantage gained with the arrangement. That is a reportable transaction, provided the main benefit test is met. Then category B, those are also attached to the main benefit test. These are specific hallmarks linked to this test. So think of, for instance, a situation where you buy a loss-making company, you stop the activities, and subsequently you try to use the losses to mitigate uh, the tax liability somewhere else. Category C. Those are. Uh, this is a category which partially is linked to the main benefit test and partially is not. For instance, an example of one where it's linked is an example where you get a deduction against the high corporate income tax rate, whereas the corresponding income is taxed in a preferential low regime. Um, and one uh, which is not linked to the main benefit test is, for instance, a double deduction. Then there are two categories left, category D and E, without a main benefit test. So if you qualify under those hallmarks, you have a reportable transaction. Category D is uh, the category concerning automatic exchange of information and beneficial ownership. Think, for instance, of structures where intermediaries try to advise taxpayers on how to uh, hide the ultimate beneficial owner. And category D concerns specific hallmarks concerning transfer pricing, for instance, the transfer of a hard to value intangible. So when, again, we have a cross-board arrangement affecting at least one EU member state and which falls on the one of the hallmarks, we have a reportable cross-border transaction. Thank you. Um, you just explained all the hallmarks and you provided already uh, a few examples. Can you provide us with one or more, one or two more examples uh, of such arrangements? Yes, certainly. I, I will give you uh, two examples, but I, I was just wondering, uh, Hank, yeah. um, because you are in a minute, of course, you are presenting your tool. I just, I, as the hallmarks are quite technical, I was wondering, does your tool cover all these hallmarks and the specifics? Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I can do it. Thank you, Monique. Um, what we have done, we have uh, one of the sections within the DAX Pro tool uh, is dedicated to the hallmarks. 
So we've done, we have done an outline of every of the five categories of hallmarks with the directive text in principle. Um, you can choose whether it's applicable, not applicable, or not determined yet. And we leave it to the user to make their assessments based on our own expertise to make that choice. Uh, but we also offer a link in the same section to a knowledge base, uh, which includes, again, the description of the directive, the explanation and the interpretation of the member states plus the UK, yeah, who are also committed to the uh, DOC6 uh, rules. Uh, on top of that, we, <coughs> we will indicate examples like you have done now. Um, so we will continue to enrich that uh, knowledge base, hopefully also with the help of Grant Thornton to yeah. validate uh, those, uh, those sections. Uh, at the same time, in every location, we also have a comment, uh, an audit trail section. Uh, so if you have a discussion internally or with external people or auditors uh, or Ken Thornton as an advisor, uh, they can also make comments and that will all be kept in, in the system. So you have everything combined together. Uh, what we haven't done is to automate uh, the decision because that's to your expertise. Yeah. Um, and given all the interpretations by member states, uh, that is, uh, you know, you have to make your own assessment and you also have to indicate that even more than one hallmark is being hit. Yeah. Uh, so that's how we, uh, in principle, deal with it within the solution. I will explain a bit later as well when we come to the the features of the tool. Okay, perfect. That yeah. helps. Um, so maybe on to your questions about uh, some examples. Without making it too technical, I thought it would be worthwhile to present uh, you with two examples. One is one with the main benefit test linked to it. So on the slide, you will see uh, a, a multinational group with an R&D department. And let's say uh, the only reason that this multinational is considering um, shifting the R&D department to another country is because of an even better preferential tax regime. Um, so let's say in this case, but it could be any country, uh, the multinational wants to shift the R&D department to the UK to make use of a preferential regime there. Subsequently, of course, there need to be royalty payments from the Dutch subsidiaries to the UK. So what you see here is that you have a deduction against the regular corporate income tax rate of 25%, whereas the in income and the royalty income is picked up against a preferential regime in the UK or whatever country it would be. So um, um, what should subsequently be assessed is what is the main benefit? Is the only reason you're shifting that R&D department to the UK or is the main reason, if that's better, uh, to shift it, the tax uh, again? And wouldn't you have done it without that? Then you are uh, meeting that hallmark and you should report. Um, a second example which I gave is uh, one without a main benefit test linked to it. So regardless of the fact whether your main benefit is to gain a tax advantage, if you meet it hall this hallmark, you should report. So what I have here is, let's say, uh, a Dutch intermediary advises a multinational company, which is, and I think that's currently quite hot, which is developing a vaccine, uh, a medicine, huh? maybe a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, um, and um, shifts or transfers this uh, uh, this uh, uh, IP to another jurisdiction. Then you have a transfer of hard to value intangible. The prognosis is uncertain. There are no comparables, so it's no expectation whether it will be success or not. This qualifies as a transfer of hard to value intangible, and you should report. Um, so in this case, where a Dutch intermediary was involved, of course, the Dutch intermediary should report, again, if there's no intermediary involved, the reporting obligation shifts to the taxpayer. Thank you for the examples, Monique. Um, if a taxpayer has such, or intermediary has such a transaction that must be reported, can you tell us when uh, they must be reported and uh, what information should be disclosed? Yeah. Yeah, of course, that's a very good question. Um, so in principle, the reporting uh, obligation was supposed to take effect as per July 1st, so yesterday. Um, but um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the representative of the EU came to an agreement that um, uh, it would be optional for member states to choose for a six months extension period of reporting. Um, last week, it was announced that the Netherlands opted in for this extension uh, of six months. And as such, uh, uh, the reporting in principle starts on January 1st, 2021. But considering the fact that DAC 6 has retroactive force, I guess it's important to have a brief look, brief look at uh, yeah, the various reporting deadlines, which there are. 
So here you see a timeline uh, uh, I made. Um, as I said, DAC6 entered into force as of June 25, 2018, or at least that's when the reporting application started. So cross-border arrangements for which the first step in the implementation has been taken in the period of June 25, 2018 and July 1, 2020 should be reported between January 1, 2021 and February 28, 2021. Um, for cross-border arrangements in which you were involved between July 1st, 2020 and January 1st, 2021, uh, you should report between January 1st and January 31, uh, 2021. So you have 30 days for that. And after that, the reporting deadline of 30 days starts. So after January 1st, any arrangement which has been made available, which is ready for implementation or for which the first step has been taken should be reported within 30 days. Um, now, having said that, I was very curious, Hank, because you, of course, did quite some demos already regarding your tool, uh, and as such, you, uh, you know, are in close contact with the uh, with the market, with taxpayers and multinational. So, what is your experience based on this extension? Were the people you spoke to relieved, or were they already well prepared for the July first deadline? Um, yeah, uh, what we notice is that. Um... Yeah, we do a lot of outings, also marketing outings, uh, in the sense that we publish a lot also on the deferral. Uh, we saw, if you look at the hits, yeah. it was tremendous. Uh, that was mm. one of the most uh, hit uh, area. Uh, <clears throat> so in that sense, you can almost relate that people were relieved uh, yeah. to see the deferral. Uh, they would, at least they were anxious to have that additional time. Uh, my biggest worry is more that a lot of taxpayers and even intermediaries are not even aware uh, of DAC6 yeah. and what's going to hit them pretty hard, I think, in the future. Um, so yes, the ones that are already busy with it, we see that they are relieved or at least they can now spend the time uh, enjoying the summertime <laughs> instead of uh, working on the transactions to report the backlog of all the two years that's due, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, so yes, we see we see some uh, relief there, but uh, again, it is six months and if you duck the summer holidays plus the Christmas recess, then I think you only have three months left still and there's a lot of work to be done, yeah. uh, even to set up your journal procedures and uh, so yes, there's some relief, but still we see a lot of uh, influx of uh, people coming in, uh, also being anxious to be helped and to be, you know, to set up something internally. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that. Yeah. And I guess that's also a good bridge to you, the second part of your question, where you asked me what should be reported, because I think on the next slide you will see an overview of the information which, which has to <clears throat> be reported. And as you see, it's a huge list. So not only some data about the taxpayer will have to be reported, but also a summary of the arrangement, including uh, the relevant business activities, the date in which the first step has been made, um, the value of the reportable uh, arrangement, identification of relevant taxpayers who are likely to be affected by it. So it's quite, quite an uh, uh, yeah, extensive list. And as such, I think it's clear that whoever needs to report, albeit the taxpayer, albeit the intermediary, this person or this team will have to devote quite some time in order to collect the information necessary and also to get everyone aligned which has to uh, provide this information. Um, and even if you're not the intermediary, again, if there's another one, then you still have to make sure that you have that reference number in your files. Um, so yeah, I guess a lot to do there. Yeah, you already touched base on, on it. Um, regardless of the postponement of six months, uh, how can taxpayers already prepare themselves for these new regulations? Yeah, that's a very good question. Because regardless of the fact that it is now extended with six months uh, for the Netherlands, um, it's coming up fast and companies need to be prepared. And I didn't tell that yet. But please note that the fines involved, especially for the Netherlands, are huge. In the Netherlands, the fines can be up to 870,000 euros for non-compliance with the reporting. So quite significant amount involved. So it's important that your company is prepared, intermediaries are prepared, as Hank said. So maybe onto a slide uh, to show you um, how I feel uh, a company could prepare himself, him or herself, for uh, what's coming to them. So first, I feel it's important for a company or an intermediary to determine their own in-house DAC6 policy. So I see some companies doing that all, already, but it's important to note who will be responsible for the reporting. Um, and are the, are the uh, requirements in place in your firm, the lines, the communication lines? 
uh, and also the communication with the relevant persons, your shareholders, your intermediaries, because of course the intermediaries have the primary obligation to report, so communicate with them. Um, and also estimate your potential compliance burden. As I said, this has retroactive effect to June 25, 2018. Are you in control what happened between that period? Because that's over two years. Um, and last but not least, how are you going to document everything? Are you going to do that in Excel? Are you going to do that in Word? Or are you going to do that in a software tool which will do that for you, which yeah, which will honk, uh, tell more about you uh, to you in a minute? Well, thank you. Um, before we go over to the tooling and um, Grant Thornton's approach, let's see if there has been any questions raised via the chat. Um, one of the participants asked uh, which countries opted in for the extension. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a good question. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, the representative of the EU only uh, agreed a couple of weeks ago that it was uh, an option to uh, go for a six-month extension. Like I said, the Netherlands only uh, confirmed that last week. Uh, some other countries who confirmed are Belgium, France, the UK. Poland and Sweden. Uh, a country which specifically uh, opted out is Finland, maybe nice to note, uh, and some other ones haven't implemented DAX, DAX 6 yet. So it's not clear whether they will give the extension, but most likely they will. Thank you. Hopefully your answer of your question has been answered. Uh, another question raised is what happens with a report? Yeah, that's a good question. So once you filed a, a report, tax authorities will send you a reference number. So if I file a report in the Netherlands, I will get a reference number of uh, the Dutch tax authorities. And subsequently, the Dutch tax authorities will submit this report to uh, the EU, an EU portal. And all tax authorities have access to that EU, EU, uh, EU portal so they can retrieve the information from that site. And then it's up to the tax authorities uh, what will be done with that. But there's one last thing I would like to emphasize that DAX6 is not something you should be afraid of. It is something you should be prepared of, but when you go through the hallmarks, also very common structures will have to be reported with no abuse at all. So I guess as a final note, I would like to say, don't be afraid, but be prepared. Thank you very much, Monique. Yes. Uh, Menno will now uh, join us. Hello, dear. Hello. Hi, Menno. Hi, Menno. Hi. Welcome. Uh, Monique already said something about the tooling and consulting so services Grant Thornton can offer. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to going into the details of the tooling, can you explain a little bit what the Grant Thornton approach to DAC6 is? Yeah. Now, basically, it consists of uh, four phases. We've seen, already seen that with uh, what Monique uh, indicated. Uh, it starts out, if you look at taxpayer, it starts out with knowing who does what, when and where. So basically making that uh, inventorization. So, so knowing that as a company. Of course, Grant Thornton can help from experience with identifying these people and setting up these processes and uh, making sure that they are encapsulated within the process. Um, Second, the, the, the inventorization of the backlog starts. Eh, as Monique stated, uh, everything that uh, is, is reportable starting uh, the 25th of June 2018 mm -hmm. needs to be reported in the Netherlands at least by uh, January uh, 31st of 2021. So we need to, a taxpayer needs to know what has happened in the past and needs to look back basically. Now, after that, um, 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 those, those reportable transactions or those potentially reportable transactions are, have been uh, uh, documented, uh, it's, it's, it's time to take to, to um, match them with the hallmarks, basically to make the assessment, is this reportable or not? Uh, finally, uh, if a transaction is reportable, if it, uh, it needs to be reported. So you need to go to the process for actually delivering that to local tax authorities. And basically steps uh, two, three, and four are iterative and repetitive. So once the backlog is cleared, you need to, going forward, have that the process in place and do it all over again. Identify what is happening, uh, 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 match them with the hallmarks, and report. 
Thank you. Well, Hank, over to you uh, and the tooling. Uh, can you explain and tell us a little bit more about the main features of the tool? Yeah, uh, thank you, Diederik. Um, obviously, I do a lot of demos and uh, anyway. Um, yeah, what's important to note, uh, we started pretty late in the process to develop the tool. Uh, the reason was that we simply waited until the Dutch and also German government issued their technical guidelines. So for us, it was the basis because we wanted to make sure that what we would build was exactly in line with what the technical guidelines prescribe. So if you uh, would look at our tool, uh, everything is in there is exactly in line with the, the XML schemes, uh, the technical schemes, they, they call that, uh, which is a kind of like a communication base uh, for the government to also uh, exchange that information with the other governments. Um, so by building it on that basis, whatever is in the tool is exactly what is being required so you know automatically you are compliant uh, so in that sense and then we added a few features very important for us is the user experience uh, so that um, i always say if you have a large man manual then your user experience is not so good uh, so we try to avoid that we give a kind of like a high level guidance and slight training but we think that our user ux uh, ex experience should be good enough to help the user immediately to go through the various steps. Uh, so in that sense, we have some key features uh, in that sense. Uh, that's the logical flow, which already includes um, uh, the, um, uh, the various uh, elements of the system, uh, including the five critical steps. Uh, first of all is we have a setup phase uh, where we basically uh, determine uh, where you have a potential exit of the system uh, because you don't want to go into assessments of hallmarks if there's no need to do that. So it can be that you have, for example, uh, a text type which is not uh, within the scope of uh, the directive, uh, which can be one of the ones that Munich mentioned, can be uh, VAT or social contributions. However, it can be exceptions uh, because some countries have the option to include those text types. Like Poland wants to have all text types, Portugal only VAT, uh, so you can have an exception. Another exception can be if you have a domestic arrangement. Uh, so typically, the, you know, you don't need to report if it's purely domestic. That's initially the scope of a directive. But some countries, again, Poland, uh, you know, includes that within the scope. So you still need to go through. The system will help you in that respect to make your choices. So it will never advise you in that sense. It will suggest something. Um, which you can override. So you always, even if you are more prudent than others, you can still go through all the steps. Uh, even you can only do the assessment, even without the reporting. Uh, so because for uh, the tax authorities, it's even more important that you assess why you do not report than that you report. Uh, so uh, reporting is, as some taxpayers or intermediaries say, yeah, I don't have much to report. That's the most common response we get. And then we say, okay, but how do you then prove that you do not have to report? So and if you don't have a backlog or clear audit trail on that, then you're going to face the 870,000 euros of fines if you don't do this properly. So that's what we try to uh, create, that everybody has the option to go through everything they want, uh, regardless of uh, reporting or not. Um, <clears throat> so in that sense, so the first step to set up that's the potential exit moment. Uh, also, um, if you uh, the next step is the and kind of like the, the indication on how the uh, arrangement looks like, a description, the summary of the, the arrangement that you're looking at. One of the examples that uh, Monique gave on the hard to uh, value uh, intangibles transfer. That's a short description of that. Then you have an indication of intermediaries, taxpayers, uh, implementation date. Those are the base fundaments which drive the reporting date, which drive who will be the disclosing person, who will be the disclosing territory. So that is the refinement section of our solution. Then you go, if you're still have to continue, because if there are no intermediaries, if, there's, if you do nothing, there's also kind of like a stop within the system. Uh, but if you, have, if you still have uh, filled that data, you can continue to the next step being the hallmark assessment. Uh, very important there is that, again, we have the general hallmarks description, so as per the directive, we're not going to deviate from that. Uh, as we all know that every country or every EU member state plus the UK may have their own views on certain elements of that hallmark. 
so that's important to help the user to guide them uh, making the assessment. So if you, for example, indicate in the beginning, I have three countries involved in the, um, uh, in the arrangement, um, it will only give you the, the knowledge on those three countries involved in that arrangement. So you don't have to go through every time to the 28 countries involved, but only the three that are relevant for the arrangement. So that's how subtle the system will help you to only look at the relevant explanations, interpretations, examples for those territories. And of course, everything is brand new. So um, the tool is also brand new. There's no, no uh, solution provider in the market to, uh, who has a very solid, uh, you know, fully uh, uh, system that deals with everything because everything is on the move. It's a moving target. Uh, we get a lot of interpretations. Uh, so we also are taking in feedback from both the users, but also, of course, from like the, the guidance just released by the Dutch government, but also from all the other guidances coming in. Uh, 21 countries still have to publish their technical guidelines. Uh, so a lot of member states not being ready yet. Uh, so this will be on the move, but at least what we promise, uh, whatever you fill in, you are providing data you need to provide to be compliant. Uh, so that's what we offer. If you have done the homework assessment uh, yourself because it is straightforward or if there are edge cases you maybe go to Monique for advice or other, other people, um, yeah, you make a decision and choices, uh, that's in the system, you put your audit trail there, uh, you have a chat function within the system where you can communicate with any user of the solution. And um, yeah, if you have done the assessment, hey, you, you list all the hallmarks that you have hit, that's very important. Don't think you're done if you hit one hallmark, you have to list them all um, with the appropriate audit trails. Then finally, if, you, if you're done with that, you go to the enrichment phase. Uh, that's kind of like the, then you know you have to report and then you need to add some features like who's the associated person, uh, from that you select the affected persons, and you also indicate the amount involved in the arrangement. And so to, to also have a feel for uh, the, um, the materiality of, of everything. If you have done that, that's kind of like you're now in a preparer mode. So you've prepared the arrangement. Uh, you're going to hand over as a preparer to the reviewer and they can, the reviewer can look at what you've done, make your assessment properly. Uh, they can or approve or they can reject. Um, if they approve, you go to the next uh, phase, that's kind of like the reporting modus. Um, I don't know whether the slide can be put up on the reporting. Uh, this is not this, this is a dashboard, um, just one further down, I think. This one, yes, thank you. Uh, so you see an overview here, the reportable arrangements you see within the system. The system will know if you have a disclosing country anywhere within EU or UK, um, uh, which XML file it will pick up underwater for your reporting. It will give you an overview of the arrangement that are reportable and you can here download or gener generate the XML. Uh, very important to note is that the system will not automatically file the report for you simply because the authorities don't offer that possibility themselves. Uh, so what happens is that you have to go to the portal or the website of the government, uh, there you go to the right spot and there you do an upload of the XML file. Uh, what we probably will be offering soon is to uh, indicate uh, the link to the exact spot on the website. Uh, however, that is kind of like with a big disclaimer because we cannot support uh, websites by governments. Uh, we can only offer a bit of help, a bit of guidance, but this is kind of like a manual effort uh, which you can do rather quickly. So. Yeah, if you would then, um, I think one step back, so the dashboard is also important to note um, because that's very important to understand the timeline. As soon as you hit the implementation date in the, in the refine section of the tool, the 30 days reporting timeline starts running. Uh, so here you see in the dashboard, you see an overview of per arrangement, what the status is and how much time you have left. And in the bottom line of uh, the, 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 uh, the visual dashboard, you see clearly if you are in the left uh, down corner, then you are, say, at risk for that arrangement. Uh, so rather be at the top side. So that's a, that's very important that you have a very easy oversight. We now offer that at uh, arrangement level. Uh, so for all the arrangements for a specific client, 
um, in the future for intermediaries who will offer also like a higher level overview of the entire organization. Uh, but that's something that's uh, coming up very soon. So we have done, this was the dashboarding part. What else was to, um, oh yeah, the bit from the storage. Important to tell, we have built the entire tool in Microsoft Stack. Uh, it is uh, a cloud solution. It's, we are a SaaS company, means that everything we build is in the cloud. Uh, we, Microsoft Azure is next to Amazon, the, the largest provider for cloud solution. Um, and everything, what we do, and that's very important for some, uh, we store everything within uh, Western Europe. Uh, so to make sure that uh, you know that your data is not uh, in the US and being exchanged with uh, the SEC or other uh, stakeholders in the US who would like to see some of the data. Uh, so that is a promise. Uh, that's also the guarantee that Microsoft is, is given. Um, uh, the, the, the advantage of being a SaaS company is means that if we do any updates, we don't need to come to you with our car and to do an update on your premise. We can do it online uh, and it will apply to everyone. Uh, we, we try to offer one solution for all. This solution is exactly the same for an intermediary as for a multinational, although for an intermediary there will be some client uh, management on top of it, which you will have available as a multinational, but you will often not use. But still, again, you can use it for regions or if you want to make separations for business divisions, you can do the same sort of approach there. We are ISO certified, um, so we can say something about security. Uh, we have the highest standards. We have just been audited for the second time. We are one of the few who've been ISO 27001 certified. Uh, a lot of IT departments are happy with that. Uh, it makes life very easy. Uh, in that sense, we have, you know, we get from clients pen test uh, requests in, and we are used to that. Uh, we also, due to the procedure for ISO, we have to comply as anyone with GDPR, uh, the uh, privacy uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you would engage with us or with Transformant together as a, as a combination, then you will see our terms and data processing agreements and everything which is necessary uh, that will satisfy your legal department uh, as well. So that's what I can say about the tool in general. Um, I don't know, Manuel, any questions you have specifically, maybe on top of what I just explained or things you missed in my... Um, no, I think it was a story. pretty good, uh, quick run through, Hank. Okay. And perhaps in the, there will be questions coming up from the audience later on, but uh, yeah. I should just move on. Yeah. Is there something on the pricing you want to say? Uh, or the, is that uh, something... That's a very good, uh, that's a very good point. Um, what the, um, um, the 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 uh, the pricing model is pretty uh, um, do you want to say something about it Hank? no no i can explain the pricing we yeah, have two uh, two models yeah, we have exactly. uh, the, the the we have a special price uh, specifically for uh, multinational tax payers mm -hmm. uh, because we recognize that those don't have so many uh, reportable arrangements or assessed to be assessed arrangements like an intermediary because that's the, you know the, da the daily bread of an uh, intermediary is mm -hmm. um, doing a lot of yeah, advisory work which are uh, by nature arrangements. Mm -hmm. Multinational also does it but in a, in, a, in a lower much lower volume. So we have one fixed price for every multinational which is two and a half thousand euros per annum. Uh, on top of that, we have a, a fee for service desk um, and the Azure environment plus the knowledge base that we offer for 150 euros per month. That's, um, that's for one year license, it's unlimited users, unlimited arrangements. Um, yeah, you get service desk access and the knowledge. So yeah, if you have you know, more than one or a few arrangements, uh, you will easily outweigh the cost. I think even a, uh, if for simple arrangement you have to go to a big four, you will easily, uh, with one consult, you already are higher than uh, the entire license fee for, for our solution. On top of that, if that's still too expensive, we offer a pay-per-use model. Um, some may think, okay, let's try it once, or maybe I have only one or two arrangements. Uh, then we will offer for 350 euros per request. Uh, means you get for us, the, you get the Excel which you can complete. We turn it back into an XML file which we hand over back to you, which you can then report. And as you asked me this morning, uh, whether 
we also offer it, you know, that people can still go into the tool. I think we can, you know, organize that, but that uh, was for me like a new request. Uh, we have to see how that works, but yes, I would love to have the, of course, anyone to have the experience to go within the tool because we really want to stay away from Excel as much as possible. So in principle, if you say you have basically two models, a full-fledged model where it licenses the tool uh, yourself, yeah. and a pay-per-use model where there's a very efficient way of, uh, you get an Excel, you fill it in. Um, uh, uh, we do the, as Grant Thornton does the uh, validation, the hallmark testing, and we send you back the uh, XML that you can attach to your, uh, to your, your, to your reporting um, to reporting page on for the on the Dutch uh, at the Dutch tax authorities. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. What we also are offering that's coming up uh, is that some some organisations already have something implemented, like a data repository. They work with a kind of a workflow manager already, uh, or a KYC client acceptance type of uh, software. Um, you know, from any legal uh, solution provider. Uh, there we offer XML as a service. Uh, so for the ones that don't do the XML reporting, we can help to uh, still help in, in offering the XML solution because we support 28 countries. Uh, so that's also something uh, which we uh, which we do. Um, for intermediary enterprises, slightly different, as you know. I don't know whether the, in the audience there are also intermediaries that um, that's that's kind of depending on the size of your organization and how many countries you are based. But uh, that's subject to discussion um, and also, you know, budget and needs and how many people are even working on the assessments. Fair enough. Yeah, Menno. Um, I guess a lot of taxpayers of the uh, uh, within the participants are now wondering. Uh, Monique explained. Um, the, the primary obligation of reporting is with intermediaries yep. and why would a taxpayer still want to have this solution? Well, you need to take a couple, into, a couple of things into account that have, have been uh, discussed before by Monique. It is quite complex legislation. Uh, there is uh, the OECD or the, the EU set one baseline, but countries are taking varying approaches to, uh, to that. But the Netherlands adopted the baseline, uh, so basically the, the, the basic legislation but countries added uh, requirements on top. Now, Poland is a very good example. Uh, uh, not only did they decide to start off and on uh, January 1, 2019 already, but they also uh, included local VAT as a, uh, as a reporting requirement. Uh, in addition, Poland has the highest fine in Europe up to, I think, 2.5 million uh, per case maximum. Uh, uh, Portugal took a, a little bit different approach. The Germans are taking a little bit different approach. So it's quite a differentiating field. There, there is one common standard, but it's still quite complex per, per, per country. Uh, you need to manage that. That's, that, that's, that's the baseline. Um, it is legislation geared, geared towards intermediaries. So basically you can think, hey, if my tax advisor doesn't, if my tax advisor should report, so I'm, I'm off to... <laughs> But we have already seen that there are basically three um, situations where uh, the taxpayer themselves needs, needs to report. Uh, if an advice is given by a non-EU intermediary, yeah. if there, and that, that happens a lot with bigger companies who have a, uh, which have a bigger internal tax team, mm. if there is a situation where uh, no intermediary has been uh, included in the advice, uh, some uh, bigger multinationals do that. Um, 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 there's also the case when your intermediary has a professional privilege. If, if, for example, in Austria, every lawyer is protected by the constitution not to have to report anything about their clients. So then the obligation reverts, reverts back to the taxpayer. Yeah. But that, that is, then you are in, in the uh, compliance and fine territory. So then you are potentially, there's a taxpayer liable for a fine. Yeah. But that's not... The whole story, I think that's only part of, uh, a small part of the story. Yeah? As a taxpayer, you need to be really wary of what happens with the data you report to, to the tax authorities. So not in as much as, hey guys, I, I'm potentially liable for a fine, but what conclusions will those tax authorities draw from the information I reported? And will they start ask questions I'm not prepared for? So if I were uh, to be a tax manager in a multinational that, that is uh, liable to tax six, I would want to know what has been reported. 
Yeah, Ank, uh, I'm sure we have thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I certainly have thoughts on that. Uh, um, I think, yeah, although indeed what you say is uh, the, the, the first obligation is on the intermediary, that's also the intent of the authorities, um, that there should be the burden. But of course, the information is on the taxpayer. Uh, so you want to know what people know on you. That would be my vision. Um, so you don't want to have uh, loose cannons of intermediaries who just start reporting on you and you don't have control over that. So I think that's the biggest worry I see with a lot of taxpayers today is that uh, they don't know what's being reported. Uh, they know less than the authorities. That is also painful. Uh, if the authorities know more about you than you know about yourself, uh, um, how do you explain that to your CFO or even the CFO to the CEO and to the, to the public? Yeah. Uh, so I see the biggest risk there, so kind of like uh, the exposure. There's also a big risk if you don't manage this that uh, the, what's being reported on you is not even consistent. Uh, so one reports this, one reports that, and you know if you have opposite stories, uh, you're an easy target for authorities. Uh, of course, you know if the if the events are not material enough, the authorities are have no time to deal with that, so they will apply their own algorithms. Uh, to see what is the what are the biggest fishes, they will also look certainly at intermediaries. You know where they expect to see reports coming from. They said to me that they're expecting to 20,000 filings um, in the first year, uh, which would be kind of like a prudent uh, guesstimate uh, on their side. Uh, but they need so they don't, they don't have the resource to manage all that. But they use software for that. So if they use software, even the authorities, and we all know how great authorities are in software. Um, but they are even then one step further ahead of you. If you're doing things manual, yeah, uh, I don't know whether you want to counter software at tax authority side with manual efforts at your side. And tax authorities also have varying abilities in being tax savvy, right? Uh, for example, the Polish tax authorities oh, yeah. are one of the most tax savvy uh, tax authorities in Europe at the moment. So they have the highest fines, they have already reporting obligations. So. There are countries where you need to be uh, No, yeah, so uh, Poland is, is, a, is, a, is a painful example. And, and, and don't forget, uh, it's not only also the, 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 the fines, it's also uh, that you can go to jail. There's a four, four, jails, uh, four years jail uh, risk, and not only for the taxpayer uh, representatives, but also for uh, intermediaries. Okay. So be careful. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and differs also by country, so very important to know that, and at least uh, for your internal risks controls, if you have internal audits, think of uh, related items like you know yearly reporting. You have to, to deal with tax contingencies. Uh, how easy it's for an auditor to just ask your uh, reports on Duck Six uh, to make a list of contingencies for you know for your year-end reporting. So there's all kinds of like interactions, and it can. It can work against you, but if you are ahead of the game, it can help you even. It can also, you know, you can show towards the public that you do, you know, that you have a clean list uh, of activities. Uh, I think you can use it also to your benefit. So there are multiple ways you can look at this. Uh, and I think this is a true game changer for the entire advisory industry, first of all, um, because, yeah, this is kind of reporting whatever you do as an advisor on a, on a, on a transactional basis. It's an, on the deepest micro level possible. Uh, so, yeah, you better be safe than sorry, I would yeah. say. Game changer indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, considering the time, um, I'm going to check whether there has been any questions raised. Yeah. Uh, one of the participants asked, uh, what IT security and confidentiality safeguards do you offer? Yeah, what I mentioned all, uh, er earlier is that, um, first of all, uh, we use Microsoft Azure, uh, the cloud, cloud environment, uh, with their security standards. Um, and we are also all assuming that Microsoft uh, has their standards uh, in, in, in a good order. They have all the, the certificates, uh, what have you, um, and those can be delivered uh, when requested. On top of that, we are ISO certified, so we comply and we have to comply um, with all the security standards. If you even enter our system, you immediately have uh, use you are see the, the, the benefits of Microsoft AD, uh, so you don't need to keep all your passwords uh, ready to, uh, to enter the system. It will automatically recognize your email address and your, uh, your, your, your credentials yeah. so that you're allowed to go into the system. Uh, so that's how we, how we deal with that.
Okay, thank you. Um, another question, I guess I will ask this one to Menno. If a, if a taxpayer does not have any reportable transactions, um, why would they need a system like the Docs X Pro? Uh, that's a pretty interesting question. Um, uh, one would assume that if you don't have anything to report, uh, you don't have anything to report, you're off the hook. But the, one of the tricky parts of Docs is that you, you have to uh, also the, you have to keep track on the uh, arrangements that you didn't decide to file. So basically, you also have to prove when you get audited, and you can be audited from an MDR perspective. Yeah, that is one of the uh, options that that is uh, that tax authorities have, is that they say, hey, you didn't report anything, but oh, can you substantiate why you didn't report that arrangement? So one might think you're off the hook, but uh, <laughs> from a auditorial perspective and, and keeping track of the decision tree, yeah. that's not the case. So. Uh, uh, and then uh, again, doing that in Excel, doing that in Word, mm -hmm. specifically when tax authorities in the, in the Netherlands can come back 12 years after the fact, uh, dig up your old emails, dig up your Word files. I would like to have a system for that. Yeah. But also think of any sort of uh, if you if you make use of any international tax advisory uh, from or internally or externally, yeah, you must have arrangements. Uh, um, maybe not reportable, but for sure that you need to assess those simply because you know those are cross-border first of all, and so that's already one of them. And secondly, um, yeah, you need to make the assessment why uh, why you didn't do that as you as you were actually making. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question: Can taxpayers send a description of arrangements to third-party consultants? Yeah, you can do multiple things. Huh? You can uh, export, uh, uh, you can import uh, from an Excel template, which we offer to, you know, for even for the backlog. Huh? That's something which we offer uh, if people subscribe now that they can clean up their backlog of two years. Uh, because I, my big assumption and is that this will not be in shape uh, for all taxpayers uh, for now, um, because of they they already making assumptions that we don't have so much to report and they don't have the time because of the daily uh, work they they are doing. Anyways, we can help them a bit on that, so we can import. But the same thing, you can also export it. Uh, we will also offer within the tool you have an exchange of communication between all the stakeholders. You can invite viewers or um, other preparers, even if you allowed it within your organization so you can exchange on that basis and what you export you can obviously also share with third-party uh, consultants and can third parties also amend anything depends on the user rights if if you, if you as an admin you give them preparer rights and they can do but that's up to your own you know user rights setting uh, we offer that user rights we cannot protect you against stupidity yeah. <laughs> That's fair, and I think there's also another point to this. Yeah. Um, if a taxpayer ask, asks a intermediary to to help them with an assess with assessing the uh, potential reportable arrangements, it's not per definition that then the the, at the intermediary becomes the reporting reporting intermediary. So just making as, as a taxpayer making sure that you get it, get your arrangements validated with an intermediary does it necessarily uh, shifts the burden to that intermediary. That's okay. one th very good thing to keep in mind, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's also useful that indeed, if you are uh, doing an in-house scheme, but you want indeed someone to validate your in-house scheme, but not being involved in the actual implementation, yeah, yeah you can have them invited as a viewer uh, or as a reviewer, even if you want that depends on your uh, proxy you want to give them. Uh, and then uh, that way, uh, review, uh, co-review the arrangement. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess one last question. What about storage, uh, the data storage for later use? The data storage in general uh, for later use in the sense that how long it's being kept or? That's not written in the question. Oh, okay, so maybe okay. you can explain both. Yeah, it's right? a stored, uh, we use again Microsoft Azure, uh, blob storage. Uh, so again, it's within uh, some of we currently, uh, it's in the Amsterdam server, but they guarantee it will be within Western Europe. That's just the storage. And uh, we keep it live as long as the clients is subscribed to it. If they want to unsubscribe because they have no arrangement or they, they don't like the tool, uh, then we allow them for uh, at least two months to, you know, delete or take out the data they would like to have. And we wait then for requests whether they, we need to purge all the data and then, then everything is clean and 
we don't keep we don't like to keep that data uh, to ourselves uh, uh, that's uh, yeah anything to add Manel? yeah 12 years is a pretty long time so uh, i would certainly take advantage of uh, having if you look at backup uh, i would certainly keep it in the cloud as long as possible what would i also as a taxpayer wouldn't hesitate to make uh, uh, downloads or copy the data on a on a uh, regular basis to make sure that you're uh, uh, you are uh, that the retention is uh, up to spec up to snuff huh? Exactly. I, one thing I have forgot to uh, mention, I think that's our joint initiative, at least mm -hmm. how it started. Uh, that's the DOC6, what we call DOC6 Enforcer. Um, we, of course, have a nice tool for making the repository assessment and reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, as we mentioned, it's a game changer, but it also is a, so it's also a change management process for a lot of organizations. How, how do they get compliance? So for that, we uh, are developing together also with, uh, with Menno and, and team to get to a what we call a um, mailer service where we will ask questions and we can make it as wide as possible but say it's one question to a group of people that you know that are dealing with making assessments with regard to arrangements um, you get a question uh, did you last week do any of uh, did you make an assessment did you report an arrangement uh, you have yes no or do not know that will be pushed back into a dashboard where the compliance officer can have a look with you uh, where he would expect people to report. If they don't, he can remind them and push them. Uh, if they do, but too often, they can also have a discussion. So it helps you in, in monitoring the actual uh, change management process and that you can also prove towards your stakeholders, like within Grant Thornton, that you have implemented something to enforce the use of the system yeah. because people don't like new tools uh, it's another thing on top of everything yeah. so this is kind of a way a gentle way of people reminding and if they want to make an assessment they can immediately go through the solution and to make the assessment uh, so that's uh, that's also coming up in uh, august September. yeah so Doc6 enforcer was designed uh, from an intermediary intermediary perspective but and you said something about it before if you have a larger multinational and you have uh, entities in various countries, I would imagine that it's also handy to keep tabs on your colleagues abroad. No, I, I know, uh, I know because I, I, I had the questions many times uh, that they are working with controllers um, or you know, the legal team somewhere else or multiple tax teams or you have various stakeholders who are often involved with local implementation efforts where advisors are involved. If you have a very decentralized organization, then it can be very useful. Uh, depending, of course, on the size of the organization. Uh, the price for that is a separate price for that. It's an add-on feature. It's not automatically included. It's uh, We are very transparent on pricing, uh, which we're proud of. Uh, it's 1,475 euros uh, full stop uh, per annum. That's Thank it. you, guys. Um, I have to uh, <laughs> round up. Uh, it's almost time. Thank you, Menno, Honk, and uh, Monique uh, for sharing the information and all, to all the participants, uh, thank you for your attention and input. Uh, in the next few days, you will receive an email with the record of the webinar of today, the slides, the contact details of uh, the speakers of today, and the uh, questions raised via the Q&A um, uh, and uh, a high-level answer. And um, we would appreciate it very much if you could uh, fill in the survey, which will be uh, put into the Q&A uh, as we speak. Uh, this will take only about one minute of your time. So uh, thank you very much. And if you have any other questions or uh, comments, please uh, contact uh, the specialists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.